<coughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to the FCCJ. Um, today's topics, as we all know, is North Korea. So the situation in the Korean Peninsula has been escalating, as all we know. Um, the, the North Korea actually uh, tested the, uh, the fir its first ICBM and now threatened to um, detonate the hydrogen bomb over the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we all agree that the adding this um, escalation is U.S. President John, Donald Trump, who has been, we don't know what U.S. policies about the North Korea right now, and then every day he's actually escalating the situation with his tweets and all these outrageous comments. Um, and also, um, and there's a speculation that North Korea is going to do something provocative next week on the 10th, when that's the anniversary for its, the country's founding day. That actually coincides with the opening of the snap election, the general election. Um, so nobody knows what's going to happen. Nobody knows the scenario. But we have two experts here today, Dr. Michish, uh, Narushige Michishita, who is the international security expert and a specialist in Japan defense policy and security issues in North Korea. And he has been published so many books about the regional security. And we also have uh, Katsuhisa, Dr. Katsuhisa Furukawa, who was the, um, the member of the panel of experts at the UN, who, act who actually monitored the implementation of the sanctions on the North Korea. So um, without further ado, let's start the discussion. Thank you very much uh, for the kind in introduction. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Um, I would like to talk about uh, North Korea's uh, nuclear and missile de uh, development and uh, Japan's response today. So there will be three parts to my uh, talk. One is uh, I'm going to talk first about uh, North Korea's nuclear and missile capabilities, and second, uh, possible objectives that North Korea has in developing its uh, nuclear and missile capabilities, <clears throat> and finally, uh, Japan's response in terms of uh, security measures that uh, the country is taking. First, uh, in terms of uh, fissile materials that North Korea has accumulated so far, according to International Institute for Science and uh, International Security, ISIS, this is a good ISIS, uh, US think tank based in Washington, uh, North Korea has uh, fissile materials enough for uh, 13 to 30 nuclear weapons uh, at the end of uh, uh, na year na 2016, last year. Uh, North Korea's uh, capability to weaponize bombs uh, or fissile materials have improved over the uh, last decade, uh, past decade. Uh, the North Korea, North Korea uh, conducted the first nuclear test in October 2006. Uh, in which North Korea uh, predicted uh, four kilotons of explosion yield, but ended up uh, with uh, only less than one kiloton of, of explosion. But in the uh, latest test uh, in September this year, uh, a sixth test, North Korea, uh, the bomb achieved the explosion yield of about uh, 160 kilotons. So within this uh, 12, uh, 11 years, North Korea has come a long way. In terms of uh, missile capabilities, uh, ca you know, um, you know, uh, that North Korea have in uh, attacking Japan, uh, North Korea has deployed about more than 200 what's called Nodong medium-range ballistic missiles (MRBMs), uh, which is has a range of uh, 1,300 kilometers. Uh, if launched, this missile will reach Japan within 10 minutes. North Korea started to deploy these missiles in the late 1990s and uh, uh, so has so far already uh, fielded more than 200 uh, pieces and operated on 50 mobile launchers. Uh, because these missiles are operated on mobile launchers, it would be very difficult for any country, Japan, the US, uh, South Korea, to find them out and uh, track, uh, track, them out, uh, track them down and uh, destroy them before they get launched. North Korea has been op uh, improving its uh, missile operation capabilities uh, in recent months. 
Uh, last year, in September, uh, North Korea launched three short uh, medium-range ballistic missiles called uh, SCUD-ER, extended range ER, uh, uh, three of them simultaneously. And uh, in March this year, North Korea launched four of the same missiles uh, simultaneously in an ap apparent attempt to uh, conduct, a, a simulate a saturation attack. Uh, because uh, if uh, there is only one missile coming at us, it would be relatively easy for us to shoot them down with our missile defense systems, but it would be uh, difficult for us to do the same if uh, four missiles are coming at us at the same time. And also, uh, North Korea has uh, recently, in um, September uh, last month, uh, launched this uh, Fason 12 intermediate range ballistic missile, which flew uh, of the, di of the distance of uh, 3,700 kilometers, and the apex of the uh, trajectory reached uh, 800 kilometers. Uh, so if uh, North Korea, North Korea uh, can actually use this missile uh, to attack Tokyo, and uh, if uh, when it uh, does so, it can uh, launch this missile in a, what's called a lofted trajectory, high trajectory like this, uh, making it difficult for our missile defense systems to take it, um, shoot it down uh, in the mid course um, of the flight. So. Um, in the, given the recent uh, development and improvement in North Korea's uh, nuclear and missile capabilities, we have to say, unfortunately, that uh, it has become a little more difficult for us to defend against um, North Korea's nuclear missiles, and uh, North Korea can uh, now credibly threaten Japan with nuclear strikes. Second, let me talk about um, some of the possible objectives that North Korea has in um, developing these capabilities. There are four. One is a, a peacetime deterrence of preventing uh, preventive strikes conducted by the United States. Uh, North Korea has been claiming, saying that uh, because uh, the United States has been taking hostile policy toward the DPRK, it was, uh, the country was forced, North Korea was forced to uh, acquire um, deterrent uh, capabilities, nuclear deterrent against um, the United States. However, this claim is, I don't think this is too important because nuclear uh, deterrence against preventive actions, limited preventive surgical actions, is, cannot be too credible because if you are threatening to use, I mean, if the United States uh, try to take out uh, nuclear facilities and missile capabilities that North Korea has, you know, using uh, nuclear weapons against the United States, Japan, or South Korea would be too far-fetched, right? So that, you know, and uh, if North Korea does so, that would certainly invite nuclear retaliation by massive retaliation by the United, from the United States. So that kind of threat, nuclear, deterrence is actually not credible. So, so the, if the, that's the case, where is uh, North Korea's uh, deterrence, peacetime deterrence coming from? Uh, it's actually coming, is coming from uh, it's, uh, uh, the number of uh, long-range long uh, artilleries and the long-range uh, rocket, multiple rocket launchers that North Korea has deployed. Uh, uh, to the north of the uh, mil military demarcation line dividing the two Koreas. <clears throat> so uh, actually those are the more credible deterrents and the nuclear and missile uh, capabilities uh, serve, serve uh, as only as a, a supplement to such a capability. So this first uh, possibility is objectives is, you know, it's, it's certainly plausible but not too in uh, important uh, in my opinion. The second uh, objective is uh, wartime deterrence, uh, which I think it was the original uh, objective uh, in North Korea's uh, intention to develop uh, nuclear weapons and missiles. Uh, if there is a war on the Korean Peninsula, uh, you know, the U.S. would be um, 
you know, uh, it would be sure that the United States and Japan would uh, uh, in intervene in the conflict uh, in support of South Korea. Uh, the U.S. and South Korea has an alliance relationship. Uh, Japan and South Korea uh, do not have alliance relationship, but uh, Japan has been long been committed to the defense of South Korea in two uh, important forms. One is that Japan has uh, been willing to allow the U.S. forces to use uh, its bases stationed in Japan. And two, uh, in 1997, uh, the US and, Jap US and Japan adopted, signed this, uh, uh, or revised what we call a, a US-Japan uh, defense guidelines, and in which Japan, as a practical matter, promised to commit our forces in support of uh, US forces operating on the Korean Peninsula. So, um, and the recent changes of uh, uh, in con reinterpretation of the Constitution made it possible uh, by now uh, for, uh, for us to, to use uh, the self-defense forces uh, uh, to support U.S. combat operations as well as logistic uh, rear area support operations in case of war on the Korean Peninsula. So, uh, you know, we don't talk about this too much, and we, when we talk about this, we tend to use a you know kind of uh, uh, kind of cover word such as uh, the situations in the areas surrounding Japan, CISJ. Uh, but uh, we, we say situations in the areas surrounding Japan, but this is actually what, uh, what it really means is a war on the Korean Peninsula. So Japan is deeply, deeply committed to the defense of South Korea. And, uh, but uh, so f from the North Korean perspective, it would be in, uh, uh, indispensable uh, to uh, prevent uh, the US and Japan from assisting South Korea in case uh, if uh, there is a war on the Korean Peninsula, and the North Korea would, be, would uh, definitely try to do so by saying, um, you know, telling the Americans and Japanese uh, that uh, North Korea would uh, attack Jap you know, uh, Japan with nuclear weapons, or attack the United States with nuclear weapons if these countries decide to help South Korea. <clears throat> So the uh, questions that they would be posing would be such uh, uh, the one uh, like uh, such as they would be saying things such as uh, uh, would you be willing to sacrifice Tokyo, New York, Washington for Seoul, and we would be put in a very difficult position. And actually, North Korea's nuclear and different uh, um, missile capabilities has been making it difficult, more difficult by day, uh, for us to keep. Uh, remain committed to the defense of South Korea. <clears throat> a third possibility is a, a kind of a limited uh, use of force scenario in which North Korea would use, like, for, for example, North Korea can uh, launch 10 artillery, long range artillery shells in the, into the uh, you know, areas uh, near Seoul. And in that case, South Korea Army, according to its uh, rules of engagement, would launch 30 uh, artillery shells uh, in retaliation into North Korea. But the question, and the, then the you know the uh, battle will stop. And the question is, who would prevail? Ostensibly, North Korea took uh, 30 shells, whereas South Korea took only 10. But uh, South, South Korea is uh, much more densely populated, and the South Korean economy is much more uh, deeply integrated into the uh, international economy. So South Korea, if that, that kind of situation uh, takes, you know, emerges, South Korea's risk premium, country risk premium, would shoot up, and uh, that would uh, put uh, North Korea, uh, South Korea in a very difficult position. Finally, uh, last possible objective that North Korea has uh, is uh, brinkmanship diplomacy. North Korea has conducted uh, two rounds of uh, brinkmanship diplomacies. See, in the past, <coughs> in the first case, uh, it st started in 1993, it lasted for about one, one and a half years. <coughs> resulting in the uh, U.S. DPRK agreed framework uh, of October 1994. The second round of uh, uh, brinkmanship diplomacy started in 2003 <coughs> and ended in two 2007 uh, in when um, the six party talks members uh, agreed, signed an agreement uh, to um, 
freeze uh, operation of uh, nuclear facilities in North Korea while the other countries decide to provide uh, economic assistance to North Korea. Finally, let me talk a little bit about uh, Japan's response. There are three pillars in terms of security measures that Japan has taken or might be taking in the future. One is a uh, missile defense, uh, deployment of uh, missile defense uh, capabilities. Uh, we have two major systems. One is uh, upper tier exoatmospheric uh, missile defense system called the SMC based, uh, SM3 Block 1A. And the other one is a uh, uh, lower tier endo atmospheric uh, land based missile defense system called Patriot Pack 3. And the, the Japanese government has invested uh, uh, one, uh, 16, 16 billion, 1616 16 billion US dollars on this. So that's a lot of money we have spent. And uh, uh, the Japanese government has decided to procure a more advanced version of a sea based. Uh, um, missile defense system called the SM3 Block 2A, which is under, uh, under development. And uh, also oh, the government is thinking about introducing another land-based version of uh, SM3 uh, Block 2A called the Aegis Ashore. So we are taking a, a look at investigating the feasibility right now. The second pillar of uh, Japanese security response is uh, uh, installment of uh, installation of uh, civil defense systems. Uh, the Japanese Diet Parliament enacted the civil protection law, which is uh, usually called um, you know, civil defense law, uh, back in 2004. And based on that law, uh, installed two different uh, warning systems. One is a text-based system called the MNET, Emergency Network, EM-NET. Emergency network, and the other one is an automated uh, voice and uh, uh, siren and voice message based system called uh, J Alert. <coughs> And from 2014, when uh, if the uh, missile is launched, then uh, uh, you know text message will be sent to uh, uh, cell phones if you have cell phones or smartphones if you have one. So it has it has uh, upgraded has been upgraded. And also uh, for the first time uh, in March this year, uh, the civil defense uh, exercises based on missile attack. Uh, uh, scenario was conducted and uh, has been other uh, additional um, exercises has been conducted. Uh, through these exercises, there we have identified several problems. One is that uh, sometimes it's very hard for people to understand uh, what the voice messages were saying. Um, and uh, sometimes, uh, in some occasions uh, recently, uh, the voice message uh, the said, told the people uh, to uh, get inside the solid buildings or underground facilities in the areas where there was there were no solid buildings or underground facilities. So they got really. Um, uh, was uh, really a uh, confusion. And the p another big problem, I think, and uh, you have to be, be very um, much um, interest, must be interested in, in, in this, but uh, there is no English messages played in uh, uh, civil defense, current civil defense systems. So um, we have to fix this uh, problem and, uh, you know, uh, by 2020 at the latest when we are holding, uh, um, hosting uh, Olympic Games in Tokyo. Sometimes we get panicky, whereas South Koreans don't. And uh, one of the reasons is that, uh, you know, we got started only in 2004. Uh, but uh, South Korea, in South Korea, civil defense law was enacted in 1975. So they've been working on this for a long time, and they are much more accustomed to this. And finally, uh, there is a debate uh, as to whether or not it's a, a good idea for Japan to introduce some level of strike capabilities. Uh, we'll see what will happen, but uh, in my opinion, I think it's a good idea uh, for Japan to introduce, acquire some level of strike capabilities. 
for four reasons. One is that uh, in the past we could rely on the U.S. without any um, problem because uh, North Korea didn't have uh, missiles capable of attacking U.S. territories. Uh, but now, because North Korea is acquiring capability, missiles are capable of attacking U.S. territories, then you know if there is a war, nobody will be taking care of the missiles targeted at, at us. We have to do the job. Uh, second, uh, if we just you know, simply keep asking Americans and South Koreans to do the job for us of taking care of missiles, um, we, uh, we would uh, be running the risk of uh, being called a free riders. You know, the South Koreans and the Americans would be saying, might be saying, well, we are, have been risking uh, the lives of our pilots and the operators. Um, for you, and but Japan was not doing anything, and the, you are free riders. And the th third, um, it, having a strike capability would be uh, would serve as a good supplement to missile to our missile defense capabilities. Because, as I said, North Korea started to uh, conduct uh, you know uh, exercises to launch missiles, multiple missiles simultaneously, in order to saturate our missile defense. It was possible for them to uh, launch multiple missiles with, uh, with impunity because they were not under threat right, of attacks. Uh, so if we have certain level of strike capabilities, uh, it would make it difficult for the North Koreans to conduct offensive missile operations uh, effectively. So that would make it e easier for us to um, conduct missile defense operations effectively. Some people say, well, it'd be very difficult for us to take out uh, mobile launchers before the missiles are launched, and that's true. But uh, that's not the point. Uh, we have, what I'm trying to say is that it, it is important, even without being able to track, uh, actually destroy the mobile launchers, uh, it, it would be enough or uh, it, it would help us if we can put pressure on North Korea's offensive missile operations. And finally, in case of uh, contingencies on the Korean Peninsula, there will be no traditional air threat by aircraft or bombers uh, because North Koreans don't have uh, you know, effective bombers, long-range bombers. So there will be, what we would be facing is a missile threat only. So if we decide not to, and uh, Japan has decided to acquire 42 F-35 fighters, which has a stealthy penetration capability, these 45 uh, F-35s would be dogging around, being wasted on the ground uh, when people are getting killed on the peninsula. And uh, so I think it's a good idea for us to commit our uh, available forces as much as possible in order to uh, end the war as soon as possible if it breaks out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Furukawa, please. Well, first of all, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm a sanction guy, uh, so don't ask me about question about deterrence. The UN sanction was originally coined as a smart sanctions or targeted sanctions. Uh, it was specifically designed to terminate uh, the flow of uh, uh, people, staff, and money uh, in connection with North Korea's WMD programs. Uh, that has been the traditions of UN sanctions, uh, which is based on the uh, previous uh, uh, lessons learned from, from the previous uh, sanction measures imposed against uh, many other uh, countries, most notably uh, Iraq. Uh, the, at this time, the Iraq was almost under the economic blockade, but uh, the sanction measures um, certainly hurt the Iraq economy and the human population as a whole, uh, but failed to uh, prevent the Iraq from terminating its uh, WMD programs in a, a verifiable manner. So after uh, learning from these uh, lessons, the UN sanction regime has evolved to uh, carry out targeted smart, smart sanctions against North Korea. Uh, but miserably, it didn't work well. So which is uh, the reason why 
the U.S. government has shifted its focus from target sanctions to a more broad partial economic blockade uh, with a near-term view of expanding uh, the blockade to the full scope in the coming months or year if situation may deteriorate. But now, with the uh, adaption of the previous sanctions, uh, UN Security Council resolutions, uh, which is uh, supplemented by uh, U U.S. Uniatel sanction measures, uh, Economic blockade may be achieved, and uh, already uh, several reports show that uh, North Korea is experiencing significant economic hardships. Uh, a very few cars running in the city of Pyongyang. Uh, North Korean businessmen having difficulty undertaking business, uh, 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 continuing trade with China along the border lines. Uh, North Korean businessmen having uh, difficulties trying to obtain uh, U.S. dollar currencies. Uh, many uh, indications are already there. But uh, the objective of the sanction is to, uh, first of all, freeze North Korea's WND programs uh, and with a view to terminating the, its program. Uh, this objective has not been uh, fulfilled. And uh, by re reviewing the current sanction regimes, I'd like to just uh, remind the audience about uh, the necessity to revisit this smart sanction concept one, just once again. Uh, I'm going to show you several examples. Uh, as you can see, this uh, photo shows the uh, Chemical Material Institute of the uh, North Korea's uh, Defense uh, Science uh, Institute, the uh, Defense Science Academy. Uh, the, the picture came uh, as a shock to me because it, it appears to show something that there seems to be a lightweight casing made of uh, carbon fiber. When I was uh, uh, investigating multiple uh, in uh, incidents of non-compliance of possible violations of UN sanctions uh, until last year, we never came up with any concrete, concrete information uh, pointing to North Korea's interest in the carbon fiber-based uh, uh, material manufacturing capabilities. Um, filament winders, I don't know how they get it, uh, the form they get it. Uh, this is uh, our, our environmental test chamber. According to a, uh, a Japanese TV producer who spotted a similar product, uh, it look, resembles pretty much to a known Japanese product of a previous generation. Uh, the, the equipment is designed to simulate an environment of uh, ultra low temperature, which is almost equivalent to, I understand, uh, as, I, as I understand, uh, equivalent to an uh, outer space environment. Now, let's see how they are prohibited under the latest Security Council uh, regime. Uh, just a, a, a month and a half ago, the Security Council has uh, uh, prohibited uh, all environmental test chambers just a month and a uh, half ago. You know, people pay attention to the Security Council resolutions when they are adapted, but people don't pay attention to the list of prohibited items issued by the uh, North Korean Sanction Committee or 1718 Committee of the uh, UN Security Council. Uh, UN Security Council. It's, there is no fabulous announcement, but you should take a look at it. And it always has uh, some exception. All environmental test chambers, except those used for civilian aircraft safety purposes. Now, if you pose yourself, if you emphasize your position to the position of uh, custom authorities of Dandong or Southeast Asian countries, uh, which don't have the expertise or scientific infrastructure to support their inspections, uh, you know, the existence of exemption is an enabler for North Korea to or illegally export or import prohibited items. That's exactly what they have been doing. Uh, 
take a look at this uh, filamentary material or carbon fiber, you see a bunch of conditions placed in the Security Council resolution last year. And it was uh, uh, um, similarly our uh, composite structure laminates carbon fibers. Again, uh, so many uh, detailed professional exemptions and conditions placed on each of the uh, prohibited items. Filamentary winding machine. Last year, they had a, uh, you know, as you can see, so many 75 millimeter, blah, 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 diameter. And now, uh, finally, just a month and a half ago, the Security Council has successfully expanded the scope of filament winding machines to cover probably pretty much uh, our, our machines and equipment, hopefully. But it's really too late. Um, similarly, uh, if you look at the uh, September 5, just a month ago, uh, newly published uh, list of prohibited items. Uh, what does it say? Composite structures of an organic matrix uh, with a condition of melting, softening, decomposition exceeding 1,649 uh, degrees centigrade in an inert environment. And you don't have some, Nobody can test this. So how do you how do you tell the custom authorities in Dandong or Southeast Asia to see whether the item they're inspecting really meet this criteria or not? Uh, you know, we Japan, U.S., uh, European countries, we join uh, multi, uh, multilateral export control regimes, nuclear supplier group, missile technology control regime. So member states have been, you know imposing ex export control regulation for decades. So our authority has means to understand what is prohibited or not. And there are also mechanisms for technical cooperation among member states. But China, um, they, have, they have been a subject of export control regulations, but they were not accustomed to actually implement export control regulations. But this is what we are telling them to do. Uh, so, to come back to my original point, uh, now we are talking about uh, prohibiting the export by North Korea of uh, uh, clothing, uh, ladies' clothing, or child children's clothing, or any kind of uh, seafood materials. Uh, but when it comes to the real hard items, it's still too professional and user unfriendly, which is significantly problematic in my view. And uh, let me just show you some, uh, let me recall your old memories. Uh, the Hwasun uh, 12, 13, 14, uh, Hwasun 14 ICBM forces. How do we neutralize these strike forces without resorting to the use of force? It's not easy or probably not possible, but still, we may be able to constrain their ICBM strike capabilities in the coming decades. Uh, you may recall that this eight chassis vehicle was a special vehicle originally manufactured by a major Chinese company. Uh, the design, original design was a WS51200. Uh, this is a special vehicle, very originally tailored for use by their North Korean customers, according to their uh, explanations. So Chinese manufacturer has elegantly manufactured these vehicles on behalf of North Korea. The manufacturer was a major Chinese aerospace science and industry corporations subsidiary company. Uh, the company's name, uh, the transfer took place in August of 2011, uh, which we found out through our investigation. Uh, and uh, the existence of the employment of these vehicles for North Korea's ballistic missile forces was known to the public in April 2012 at the occasion of Pyongyang military parade. Following the uh, uh, Following this parade, uh, the Catholics' name became really famous 
throughout the world because many press reported on this classic vehicle applied by North Korea for new type of ICBM uh, TEL, Transport Electro Launcher. I was, at this time, I was closely monitoring the website of the CASIC, and uh, to my surprise, uh, clearly their English website was expanded uh, after their name became notorious in my view, mm. but famous for them. Uh, significantly, the English website get, get better, uh, and this is the CASIC subsidiary's uh, original pamphlet of similar types of vehicles. Uh, HSC, uh, WS series. And uh, at that time, the explanation was made that uh, North Korean side, the customer was uh, a Ministry of Forestry, and uh, uh, they got end user certificate from North Korea, which is why they exported the six vehicles to uh, North Korean customer. Actually, not only expo, designed, manufactured, and exported to North Korea. So uh, we are seeing this uh, uh, Chinese vehicle, special vehicle, currently applied to Huasong 14 TEL, Transport Expo uh, Erector Launcher. But to the best of our knowledge, uh, North Korea m obtained only six of these vehicles. So if they are to strike uh, launch ICBM, at least as of now, and probably in the near futures, they have only six vehicles, mm -hmm. which should constitute their bottleneck of the DPRK strike force. Now, you see uh, Hwasong-14 uh, bus missile you know, running around many places in the countries. So we can reasonably presume that uh, maybe they need the spare parts uh, definitely, because the uh, terrain in North Korea is so rough, road condition is bad, and uh, this vehicle is carrying a sensitive long-range rocket, which is uh, electric, mechanical, electronically and mechanically sensitive items. So always the uh, the plot, uh, the plate part has to maintain the uh, know, horizontal, uh, horizon mm. horizontal. Uh, posture, which really uh, requires a number use of number of suspensions and uh, computer softwares. Uh, my concern is how they get spare parts. I, I, I assume they already have spare parts mm. accumulated, but we can limit the number of their spare parts uh, stocks. The problem is, however, probably uh, the spare parts, when you disintegrate each of them, it's not going to be meet the criteria of the UN Security Council's list of prohibited items, which is a problem, significant problem to me. If we can successfully block North Korea from further procuring necessary spare parts for their ICBM tell, we will be able to uh, basically uh, narrow down or squeeze their ICBM capabilities without using the force. And that's what the UN sanction regime was originally intended for. But, you know, no member states, uh, only a few member states s seriously uh, implemented this regime. So uh, most majority of members say it doesn't even have a law to cover these items today, which is why we are here today. Uh, South Korean KBS, KBS News uh, reporting on the Chinese tires for use by the tail of another type of, uh, uh, I mean, Huasong 14 bus missiles. And uh, you may think that tires, but it's, it's tire. Well, why are we <laughs> exporting them still today? And uh, this is a screenshot from uh, NHK News as of uh, January 23rd of 2013. The, f the year following the uh, 2012 when Kasich's name became famous worldwide. It's a NHK news report on the uh, DPRK investment seminar that took place in China. 
And uh, I just happened to spot a delegation of Catholic people participating in DPLK investment seminar just after they were, according to the explanation, deceived by North Korea. Uh, to me personally, this has to be a subject of the United Sanction Measures for their deliberate lack of due diligence. What happened to the target sanction regime? Uh, I'm, I'm to save the uh, time, I um, need to just spot some key points. North Korea has been applying the policy of uh, uh, Bunjin line, which is to uh, advance the twin policy priorities of economic development and the nuclear de weapons development simultaneously. And it has been the declared policy of Kim Jong to enable spin-off and spin-on of the technologies and product between the economic industrial sectors and the nuclear weapons uh, related sectors. And it, that's exactly what they have been doing. Uh, but somehow, let's check uh, the list of prohibited dual use items published by the uh, Security Council 7018 Committee on August 22. You know, media was excited by the adoption of the Security Council resolution on the August, uh, early August, uh, but nobody paid attention. Uh, it's just a two-page list, a very short list, and uh, it's just a, essentially it's a one-page list, which can't, can't contain really a small number of items. Now another list. September 5th, various items, a new, newly adapted prohibited item list. Uh, it says telecommunication systems with a, a range of uh, specific uh, conditions attached to it, which you don't even want to read. Why, you know, on the main text of the resolution, it says you know, all kind of marine product, uh, what was that, uh, fish product or whatever. But when it comes to telecommunication equipment or electronic computers, it has such a stupidly detailed professional uh, conditions attached to it. Uh, Security Council resolution doesn't say, you know, prohibit the export of clamps with a diameter of uh, three centimeters. But that's what it says when it comes to a uh, computer or electronic items. Uh, and the list which was just newly adapted, uh, you see uh, a bunch of items, but still far from sufficient. For your reference, uh, there's uh, another various items adapted uh, uh, in early September. Nickel alloy, having a stress life of blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, st stress rapture life of 10,000 hours or longer at 650 degrees centigrade, blah, blah, blah. To easier reference, uh, 10,000 hour is equivalent to 416 days. So custom authority has to undertake inspections for more than a year if they don't have access to uh, scientific support from somewhere in the country or from other countries. This is what they have to do to figure out whether a particular item is prohibited or not. Uh, it's so ridiculous. So we have s still many tasks to cover before we go into the uh, field of a total economic embargo. And uh, sorry for the interest of time, but I have to just give you some few more examples. Uh, there are certain people who wants to be deceived by North Korea. I show you the ICBM tail. Let's see the uh, 300 millimeter guided artillery rockets tail, which newly appeared in October 2015. The vehicle was manufactured by Sinotrack. And again, it was explained to us at the last time by the Chinese government that uh, the vehicle was intended for use by the forestry business. Uh, and it, actually, that's the uh, main advertisement by the uh, Sinotrack. And the same vehicle also appeared early this year 
in their uh, military parade carrying the uh, uh, polar hokkyokusei. Yeah. No, no, no polar, polar. polar star, no, uh, polar star. Polar, polar star uh, missile systems. Uh, this is a soundtrack as advertisement for uh, the uh, forestry business. One thing that they didn't tell us was that the vehicle was certainly used as a multiple rocket launcher tell uh, in China. So it's been used for military applications, but still they are saying that they are deceived by North Korea. Uh, again, personally, I, this is a deliberate negligence of due diligence, which should be subjected by uh, under the United Sanctions by relevant member states. Don't expect U.S. Security Council to designate Chinese company or Russian company. It's not possible. We couldn't even recommend them for designation because of the apparent uh, opposition from China and Russia. So it's not going to happen. But member states can do it. Russian tracks used for Ken 06. Again, it's based on the uh, joint venture business between Russia and uh, North Korea, which continued up until 2011. The design was applied to uh, for multi uh, applications. It's a Tebaksan uh, 96. That's the uh, uh, name, name of a brand name. And again, this year, the, uh, one of the tell had a, a Korean script of Tebaksan, which appears to show similar uh, series of designs. Uh, this is the original tell, uh, which is from the Kamaz, the major Russian uh, multi-vehicle manufacturer, which is also expanding their business significantly into the field of uh, uh, civilian vehicle uh, manufacturer. Uh, uh, but, you know, so you see a common pattern of uh, those Russian and Chinese companies always deceived by North Korea. And uh, they say that uh, uh, Always, uh, there are, uh, North Korea has signed a contract sh assuring that these vehicles would not be used for military applications. One thing that I, it's not clear to me at all is, so what happened, what, what penalty do they impose on North Korean uh, customers once they know that they, they violate their contract? I never heard a, of any explanations from both governments. And this is just uh, the latest in news from NK Pro. A Pyongyang International Trade Fair uh, just took place last month, uh, where the Chinese Darius construction vehicle, again, it's a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven chassis, uh, is now was advertised for sale in Pyongyang Trade Fair, which is violation of the resolutions. Last uh, example, very quickly. Unha 3 rocket 2012 launched successfully in December 2012. The first stage debris was uh, collected by the South Korean Navy at this time. And uh, uh, there, uh, a range of foreign sourced items were found, um, particularly uh, one example show pressure transmitters manufactured by the UK company was used uh, in the separation, the fairing, the separation part of the Unha 3 rocket. The item itself is, did not meet the criteria of prohibited items. The North Korea used low spec items of the uh, pressure transmitter. Intermediary was a notorious company uh, named as Royal Team Corporation based in Taiwan, which was sanctioned by the local authorities in late 2000s for their illegal export of strategic items to North Korea on multiple occasions. Other foreign source items, um, Chinese CCD camera, 
used to monitor the ascent process of the Amuhasu rocket, which is available online at the price of 20 US dollar. Um, um, all the Soviet Union items, I believe it's all the Soviet Union. I want to believe so because that's what the Russia has explained to us. The fairing part, uh, particularly, should draw attention because I understand that the similar mechanism must have been applied to the Huasun series if they are intended to separate uh, long range rockets. Uh, and here, uh, around 10 kinds of foreign source items was found. And each of them are really small, cheap items. This is a, a temperature transmitters from UK, available online at the price of less than 100 US dollar. Uh, electric register from UK. Uh, DC to DC converter from Switzerland. Uh, electric interference filtering. Uh, device from China, OPAMP from US, uh, other computer related equipment from U US, Korea, uh, US. Um, all these items uh, have been the key components for North Korea's missile capabilities. Uh, if they don't have, it's going to be costly for them to manufacture each of these items. And uh, Sadly, these items have multiple civilian industry applications, which is the reason why UN Security Council has not prohibited these items. But now, let's consider this. We are prohibiting all kinds of coals, steels, iron ores, uh, marine products, uh, but not this, this one. Uh, why? Uh, we are not allowed to import Ladies clothing from North Korea, but we are allowed to <laughs> give computer chips or these items to North Korea, even today. So uh, we have uh, certain tasks to finish, and uh, this is a 2012 story, but it's not all the story. Last year, February, the long -range, another long range rocket, same uh, UK made pressure transmitter was found, but this time they switched, North Korea switched procurement route from Taiwan route to Beijing route. Mm -hmm. But I assume that same people may be operating behind the scene. And uh, just as a last remark, uh, the uh, last month, Pyongyang Trade Fair, uh, there was a Royal Team Corporation who supplied this pressure transmitter from UK to North Korea. They are still allowed to travel from Taiwan to Pyongyang to attend trade fairs, and uh, the pressure transmitter that they brought to North Korea in 2010, they brought on a handbag carry, handbag uh, uh, carried on board. So there's no export declarations or no record of transfer. And now they're still there. So we have a tremendous tasks to do to implement the UN sanction regime in uh, effective and, uh, and full scope. Uh, and uh, the economic embargo may not be the uh, answer. We have to fix, we have to do our uh, assignment. Well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Michishita and Dr. Furukawa. Um, if it's just to me, there's a lot of things, a lot of actually loopholes that we have to deal with, the UN actually deal with, but um, it's interesting to hear. Um, so we have about 35 minutes, so I'd like to um, open to the floor. So if you have any questions, please address your name and affiliation. So working table, professional table from first, so um, Isabel. Uh, Isabel Reynolds from Bloomberg, thanks very much for your talk. Um, I'd like to ask about uh, the role of China uh, in 
all this in, in deterring North Korea. Um, some commentators have said that the fact that Japan has such poor relations with China at the moment is one of the reasons why we haven't been able to deter the situation effectively. Um, but given that they don't seem to be taking the tank sanctions seriously at all, would improving ch Chinese relations help improve the situation as a whole? Uh, <coughs> well, from my experience, I don't think uh, China is not serious about uh, imposing sanctions. Their attitude certainly changed after 2000, particularly after 2013. Uh, when Kim Jong-un took power and uh, uh, apparently um, demonstrate, uh, how to say, a, a posture to, um, to uh, you know, uh, publicly disregard Chinese request or, um, I mean, North Korea has not obeyed or, uh, or follow up on the request from uh, China. And the, the, the degree of uh, who could you tell them? Diso disobedience. disobedience became really significant as years go by. And that's what we are here today. Um, I think uh, what China needs is something, you know, you need a political pressure, but that's not, that's not uh, uh, the, um, well, beyond that, you need to give them capacity building support for Chinese custom authorities, export control authorities. They don't, they don't know and they don't understand UN sanction, re, UN resolution, they don't know. And foreign ministry, they are supposed to understand Security Council resolutions, but not quite well from my experience. So you see Chinese Minister of Foreign Affairs who knows relatively you know, better than uh, other ministries about uh, international laws, but they don't know the actual tools that are needed to implement these sanction regimes. And local governments, private sectors, and all the other ministries and agencies, uh, they, have, uh, uh, they know the tools, but they have they don't know, lows. It's a uh, stove piping is so terrible and the uh, low uh, rules of law is not so well fixed in China and I'm sure there are still ongoing corruptions uh, in addition to the fact that uh, the, you know, the cross-border regions between China and North Korea, it's you know, ec economically and socially integrated regions. So, in addition to the political pressures, my view is that we need some more mechanism for capacity building support at the working level. You know, all Japan and all China, or US and China, and that has to be enacted. Otherwise, you know, Chinese authorities cannot stop those items that I show you. So That's just actually what two questions to him. <clears throat> One is that the, uh, the, now the US, US, UN security Security Council has ad, um, adopted pretty robust sanctions on North Korea. But you are talking about how difficult it might be to actually implement uh, the sanctions adopted at the uh, Security Council. Uh, in terms of the current uh, sanctions, you know, the, the sanctions that are, have been uh, recently adopted, how much time do you think would, would it take uh, for, particularly for China, to implement? And uh, in addition to that, after they are implement, fully implemented, how much more time uh, would, uh, might it uh, take for those sanctions to uh, start um, taking effect? Another, another question is that uh, you talked about a lot of ex exceptions and the loopholes that, that are kind of uh, installed in uh, some of the sanctions uh, resolutions. Who in the first place insisted on putting those items in uh, re resolutions? Uh, to, to go with the easy question, the second one, uh, <clears throat> the resolution's main texts are drafted by the diplomats, principally, uh, but more specifically, the US State Department and uh, uh, to be authorized by all other US government uh, mm. uh, apparatus. 
the list of prohibited items are, I understand it's still drafted by the professional experts, which is why the list is so ridiculously rigid mm. and serious about details. And uh, it's, it's, they're giving rooms for North Korea to maneuver, you know. But what if they are U.S. officials, why are they, you know, they wanted to leave some, you know, kind of exceptions and loopholes in those? Well, <laughs> I, I don't know, but uh, I understand that since last year, the State Department or White House has been concentrating on uh, re, 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 you know, reducing the uh, foreign, source, uh, foreign income source mm -hmm. right. for n North Korea. Uh, and, and frankly, uh, you know, this is my personal view, but you know, terminating some computer items or electric items, it, it doesn't go well in the headline of uh, the people in this room. So uh, if you remove 50% of North Korea's uh, foreign source income, it will be a headline. And it's uh, considered to be a major achievement. But if you, you know, designate the all kind of computer as prohibited items, it, it, it's not so fancy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, but at the personal level, there might be some, uh, yeah. That's puzzling. Yeah, my um, sense of achievement is different, I think. But to me, these um, details are the most important because North Korea always cheat mm -hmm. these details. And that's why we have to neatly, you know, uh, you know, put, you know, cover the whole, root hole, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is not uh, going well even as, as we speak today. So how much time will it oh, take? I, I don't know. Uh, you know, we'll see uh, the next... Uh, uh, the, you know, two weeks after the Chinese uh, uh, party, com Congress. Yeah, pa party Congress. Uh, after this, uh, there may be some change in the uh, Chinese posture. But uh, unless China really put significant efforts to close the border uh, with North Korea, mm -hmm. uh, it's not possible because if you look at any country, Japan, US, Europe, uh, you know, we have a significant, uh, you know, rules and regulation, but despite that, uh, the uh, smuggling continues, mm -hmm. and uh, how many foreign illegal workers are reside in each country, and why do we expect only North Korean, uh, you know, <coughs> laborers mm -hmm. to be successfully expelled mm -hmm. from all over the world? Mm -hmm. it, it's That's not going to happen, and. Mm -hmm. uh, the you know the Dandong areas. I mean the China and the North Korea borderline areas. On each side of the borderline, their relatives uh, you know live separately. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there are strong incentives for corporations, and there are reports these days about the more active involvement of uh, illegal local uh, mafia networks mm -hmm. to assist in the uh, actually. Uh, to earn money from the smuggling on behalf of North Korea these days. So this is going to be our hell. So it's going to continue forever. And so the question is how, how much we can squeeze. Uh, mm -hmm. But terminating smuggling, uh, I don't have a prospect. Okay, going back to the floor. Thanks for your presentations. My name is Daniel Hurst, a freelance journalist. Um, Professor Majishta, um, you mentioned the progress North Korea has made te technologically. Given how far they've come, is it still realistic for the US to hold to denuclearized de Korean Peninsula? Uh, or, or should the aim be to stop any further development? Um, and secondly, there have been uh, mixed messages, to say the least, coming from um, the Trump White House and the administration about its approach towards North Korea. From what you know about North Korea and how it, um, the regime behaves, is there a benefit in this sort of unpredictability? Like, is, there, is there a benefit or, or would it be better to have a consistent mm -hmm. um, uh, single message? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> firstly, um, 
So the question is whether or not uh, dismantlement of uh, nuclear program entirely is a realistic objective. I don't think so. At least uh, for the time being, uh, you know, freeze of uh, nuclear testing as well as uh, missile testing and uh, you know um, operation of freezing of operation you know nuclear operations of nuclear facilities would be the most realistic objective and uh, you know even achieving those goals would not be easy right and uh, so we have to i think uh, at some point we have to engage in some kind of dialogue in with north korea but the uh, question is uh, timing, because uh, we are now, you know, we are already, in, you know, in my opinion, the countries involved, North Korea, Japan, the US, you know, South Korea, they are already in a pre-negotiation bargaining process in which North Korea is trying to improve its uh, nuclear and missile capabilities in order to strengthen its bargaining position in the, you know, future talks. We are trying to enhance our bargaining positions by imposing more sanctions and uh, strengthening our defense capabilities. So we will see, find out after a month and about a year or so, uh, 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 which side the time is on. And then, you know, we will decide which side will have to take an initiative and a kind of um, say first, you know, well, let's talk. Um, so um, we are kind of competing with, it, with time. And uh, so that's, and uh, the first, uh, and actually, uh, I think at least there are three um, important objectives uh, from Japanese perspective <coughs> to talk to, well, not only from Japan, uh, to uh, engage in dialogue in, with North Korea. One, uh, because we have a new leader, young, you know, uh, not really experienced leader in Pyongyang, we have to really find out what his objectives are, right, and the capabilities are. So in order to, unless we engage in serious talks, we will not be able to find that out. Two, um, we, in order to come up with a little more, I mean, there are only bad options uh, in front of us, so we have to pick the best of the bad options, right? Um, and, but uh, we don't know, unless we engage in talks, uh, we cannot, cannot know whether we, there is a better option than just leave things as uh, they are. And finally, uh, in a broader perspective, uh, North Korea is really a drag on Japanese strategy because the most important uh, you know, objective or part of the Japanese security strategy is to kind of uh, maintain peace and stability in the face of rapidly rising China and uh, you know China, which is becoming more assertive, and th there is no time for us to you know uh, spending you know too much time and uh, resources on North Korea. So, uh, from my perspective, this is my pers you know personal opinion. We have to kind of get it North Korea issue done as soon as possible, so that we can rebalance uh, f uh, you know away from Korean Peninsula toward uh, China. Trump's unpredictability. Uh, to a, an extent, he is playing this, the game intentionally, but you know, to some extent, um, he is not. He is just you know, simply predict, unpredictable, and we don't know. So that's a kind of um, bad news, good, good news, bad news, because uh, unless the person is really unpredictable, the game of madman, you know, madman game. Uh, play does not work very well, right? So it is a good thing uh, that Trump has at least, you know, su successfully convinced the people out in the world that he's a little crazy, right? But at the same time, it's uh, bad news that he can be real crazy, <laughs> really crazy. So I mean, so there is a bad, good news, bad news. For the timing being, there are two good news at least. So good news, uh, one is that uh, the, Mr. Trump can be unpredictable, but people around him, you know, uh, Mr. Maris and uh, the McMaster, and uh, they are very experienced and very balanced and very, you know, uh, sophisticated. Uh, the decision makers, that, that's a good news. Two, 
uh, Prime Minister Abe has a good personal relationship with him. So it's, you know, at one point he said, you know, after talking to him, he told, he said to Abe, I miss you. So that's a good news. Uh, so we can kind of uh, think um, that safely think, assume that if Trump is to take some important actions in this region, he would probably consult with uh, Mr. Abe uh, in the first place. So those are the good news. Any other Sigfrid Nittel, freelancer from Germany. I think one, one or two years ago, um, Japan negotiated with North Korea yeah. about the abductees. Yeah. And so it, it, it was in, perhaps in, in contradiction to the, to the American North Korea policy. Now, uh, now uh, 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 Mr. Abe is, goes in the opposite direction. But this kind of uh, opposite from one extreme to one extreme, is not he uh, in the same way unpredictable like uh, Mr. <laughs> like Mr. Trump? Well, I don't think so. He is very consistent. Um, he is very much proactive in uh, engaging dialogue and uh, with North Korea. So that's a good news. He started this engagement uh, just after, as you suggested, uh, he became uh, prime minister for the second time. And uh, uh, actually, Japan and North Korea came up with a, a, an agreement on humanitarian issues on four different uh, issues in um, 2014 in St Stockholm. And uh, so that's a reflection of the fact that um, you know Prime Minister Abe is interested in dialogue or engagement. But at the same time, it's a perfectly rational thing for him to talk about pressure right now because, as I said, we are in a pre-negotiation bargaining process. If you are, you are you know you are trying to convince the other side that you are in a stronger position, and if you know if you start talking about dialogue, that would make your position weak. Right? That would undermine your position. So from a tactical bargaining tactics perspective, it's a rational thing for him to s keep saying. But if he would, uh, you know, he, ca he is stupid if he's really not thinking about the next step while saying that pressure is important. But I think he does. Well, I don't know, but uh, that's my gut feeling given his, what he has been doing in the past. My name is Patrick Welt, a German newspaper, Frankfurt Allgemeine. I have two or three questions, two to Mishita-san. First, if you, if you think about what, what has to happen for North Korea to be willing to talk to, uh, to gay, go into negotiations? And my second question to you is, if you look at the strategy of South Korea, uh, presenting the opportunity to dialogue and on the other hand trying to play strongman towards North Korea, how do you judge that uh, mm -hmm. strategy compared to the US or the Japanese strategy? And my question to Fukawa-san is, did I really understood it right? You assume that the Chinese are not able to, uh, to really impl implement at the Chinese-North Korean border the trade regimes they try to, uh, to they sign at the UN headquarter? I mean, is it really, I mean, when you talk about they need uh, help to for their customs regime, is this really an, doesn't isn't that a sign that the that the government in Beijing just don't want to implement these sanctions? Are you saying they want to implement but they are not able to do? Thank you very much. Firstly, um, so on what kind of on what conditions uh, North Korea might be willing to talk? Uh, well, I mean, uh, I don't know the specific conditions, but I mean, I think uh, North Korean objectives in uh, this, uh, you know, uh, bring partnership diplomacy is about improving relationship uh, with uh, no, uh, the United States and Japan. That would be the most overall uh, important goal that North Korea has. That's that's my kind of. Uh, um, 
assessment, but I might be wrong, and uh, we have to really find out whether this, these are the real goals that they have, and uh, in order to do so, we have to uh, talk to them at some point, not now. And uh, um, so I think some of the things, we, we can do some things uh, more specific, you know, let me talk about le some specific um, items to be talked about. Uh, one is uh, we can kind of uh, talk about uh, possible cooperation on the peaceful use of uh, nuclear energy. Uh, first, uh, the f for two purposes. One is to make it possible for North Korea to you know, freeze their program without losing face. They can say, well, we are simply going back to the original uh, objective of peaceful, you know, using peaceful, developing peaceful and nuclear energy. That was what they were saying until 2004 when they switched um, the, their objective. And uh, uh, there, another thing is that we might be in, uh, might want to engage in a joint uh, development, peaceful uh, uh, space development program with North Korea, uh, and because uh, North Korea has uh, consistently distinguished between peaceful space programs and uh, military missile programs. So we can kind of play into it and uh, say, well, we, you get rid of, uh, uh, you know, mi military programs, and but uh, we can co cooperate on a peace, uh, peaceful part of the program. And the uh, second purpose is, uh, I missed, uh, failed to talk about it. In each, both cases, by engaging in joint project on space programs and the nuclear energy programs, we will be able to have a pretty intrusive access to North Korea's nuclear and missile programs. So that would be a benefit for us too. And plus, uh, we should probably talk about uh, you know economic assistance. Uh, and uh, in the past occasions, what we did was just to simply provide consumption good, uh, goods, such as heavy fuel oil, right? And so when it's consumed, the, you know, there was uh, no, lo no incentive um, for North Korea to keep abiding by uh, the, the agreement. So that was a poor, poorly designed agreement that we had in the past. So I think uh, from the uh, next time we, uh, when we engage in talks, we have to think about uh, development aid, which should be kind of built up and uh, in a step-by-step -step approach. So it, we should be very creative in coming up with a kind of sustainable, um, long-lasting uh, kind of a, a scheme uh, with which they, uh, we can, we will be able to uh, keep uh, providing incentives for North Korea to uh, keep abiding, abiding by the freeze. And also, um, South Korea's um, strategy of uh, mixing pressure and, uh, uh, you know, um, and uh, kind of uh, uh, aid. I think there is a, a level of, uh, you know, it's, it's almost inevitable for South Korea to be a little softer than other countries because uh, certainly um, it's a liberal, you know, kind of uh, 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 administration. I'm very much interested in uh, engagement uh, with North Korea. But also, South Korea is going to host a uh, Winter Olympic Games in February next year. And uh, so North Korea can ruin it and, uh, you, know, p p you know, in order to put pressure on South Korea and other countries. And so s South Korea has to work uh, this, uh, you know, very, um, to strike a good balance uh, between putting pressure on North Korea while you know, um, preventing it from kind of uh, rushing out. Oh, no, no. The, the short answer to my question is yes, that's my understanding. The, uh, China has been always taking some measures when we pointed to violations that took place in China, but they never announced officially or publicly However, the problem about Chinese government sanction measures is that they are so weak in the follow-up actions. When they close specific companies of North Korea quietly in Beijing, they didn't notice that uh, the same individual opened another company in the same building. Um, last year, when the Security Council uh, for the first time designated 
more than 30 vessels to be the uh, you know, subject of UN sanction measures. Chinese uh, diplomats in charge didn't know, they didn't know that the, among the 13, uh, among the 30, uh, as I recall, there were six or seven vessels owned and operated by Chinese companies, but Chinese government couldn't, uh, they didn't know. I told them that these vessels were operated and owned by Chinese companies, and I asked for their help for investigation. But as yet, they didn't quite understand. And uh, this is a reality. So, and uh, I see a similar stories are from elsewhere on multiple occasions. Uh, of course, there may be some, uh, you know, local governments who are not willing to enforce rigid sanction measures, but at the minimum, we have to find a way to, uh, how, do you, how do you say, the, um, yeah, the, uh, no, my, uh, s s enlarge the uh, power of uh, those who are who feel responsible for sanction measures in Beijing and uh, any other mm -hmm. um, local governments and the uh, Chinese private sectors they also have to understand that if they continue to do business with North Korea irrespective of uh, international laws they would lose their job and that's a that's the uh, message of the United sanctions by US, Japan, and others. And it has to be coordinated uh, so that we, we give a direct voice to the Chinese in, uh, industrial sectors. This is not a measure to you know, uh, humiliate Chinese government at all. It, it's, it's a, it has to be a measure to assist Chinese government to implement UN, UN sanctions. Thank you very much. We have about less than 10 minutes, so make it, please make it quick. Thank you. I am uh, Yann also with the French Business Paper Les Echo. One question on sanctions. Where does details that you show us, all the details for every product, comes from? Is it purely a technocratic flow? Or is there any lobbying behind the writing on those sanctions by China or Russia to make sure that nobody will get it? Or which way? Is it, is it political or is it just people who wrote it just don't pay, pay attention? And secondly, on the, I don't really get the issue of wh where is the, what is the priority of Japan. Mm -hmm. Prime Minister Abe keeps on telling us, I want to bring back the abductees, I want to work on that, I want mm -hmm. to open new dialogue. Where are we now on that? And can, can it be heard at the same time when he's following Trump, uh, really uh, on every point Trump is saying? You know, the families are saying they don't hear anything uh, at the moment from uh, from the administra Abe administration on on the on what's happening on the family over there. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I I don't know. Um, I'm not involved in uh, uh, decision making process of this administration, so I don't know. But uh, you know, my gut feeling is that uh, priorities are certainly um, on the um, you know um, addressing the issue of uh, nuclear missile. Uh, development uh, that North Korea is undertaking because uh, that uh, really poses uh, uh, you know, immediate uh, and uh, very significant threat to this country. And uh, abduction, you know, despite the uh, rhetoric, probably would come second. Uh, but I think it's a good idea for us to take on nuclear and missile issues first because, uh, you know, one it is more, you know, kind of uh, international and more significant and more immediate. Well, I mean, immediacy might, be, might not be too different, but um, and uh, unless we tackle these issues, we will not be able to get to the abduction issue because North Korea is playing this game and abduction is not uh, their priority. So it's a good idea to first uh, you know, uh, tackle 
a nuclear missile program and then uh, take a step forward. So I, I think after some kind of talks on nuclear and missile issues, uh, you know, get started in, a, you know, I don't know what kind of form, you know, six party, seven party, even not just bilateral US DPRK. When it gets started, I think uh, that would be, uh, provide a, a good opportunity for Japan to start engaging again with North Korea on that, the abduction issue. It, uh, the list is uh, basically uh, it, uh, it's political because it requires the uh, consent from all the other. Uh, it requires a consent of consensus of all the uh, Security Council's committee member states, which include China and Russia. So the end result is political, but it's principally drafted by the experts based upon the uh, technical uh, technocrat based upon the uh, discussions in the NSG or MTCR or other places. Where are they? Hmm? Yeah, NSG, you have to uh, say. Uh, nu nuclear supplier group or missile technology control regime. The, uh, so, oh, but, but the thing is, now China has agreed to prohibit the uh, import of all coal or iron ores or all the other kind of major product, which significantly affect Chinese local economy, especially those along the borderline regions. Now, why are they not going to, you know, agree on uh, uh, prohibiting uh, categorically export of uh, certain electric items or? machine tools. Uh, I think uh, we have a significant political uh, capacity at this point that w we need to really l look, uh, you know, review the list of prohibited items now again. Okay, we have three minutes for um, <laughs> uh, Somebody from the working press, uh, a you working place as well. So he was raising hand before him. So. I try to be quick. Um, Regis Arnaud from Le Figaro. Um, you talk about J alert and the warning system, and you say it doesn't work very well. But I'm surprised you don't even mention, you don't even uh, um, consider that the very existence of this system. I mean, for many foreign or outside observer, it seems quite ridiculous to have everybody running around in a, in a territory as big as Cambodia for basically zero risk. And it gives an image of Japan quite ridiculous. But you seem to be okay with that. You seem to say there are problems in, in the way it's applied, but not in, in the very alert itself. And it has very big political implications because, of course, it pushed people against pacifism and towards changing the constitution. So do you think this, this kind of whole uh, operatic mode of the of the alert has political consequence and do you think it's a good thing for Japan the way this this, this alert the wide the width of its range on to you are talking you. about Japanese security policy about J alert and about uh, the warning oh, system okay. when they start thank you um, J alert and well J alert and uh, um, you know those uh, civil protection measures are basically designed for natural disasters which are more likely and more immediate threats so um, but uh, you know overall uh, I think your characterization of Japan uh, moving away from pacifism uh, is I think is misplaced because in my opinion, Japan is actually moving away from isolationism toward internationalism. Uh, because, you know, people say, well, we are pacifists. We are not pacifists. You know, Japan has uh, uh, supported all, most of the wars that the United States have fought. And uh, uh, we even financed, uh, you know, we provided the $13 billion to the war effort in the Persian Gulf in 1991. Pacifists don't support wars or, or uh, finance wars, we did. And um, so it's not really, you know, despite what we say, uh, we have been security isolationists. And, uh, you know, the question is, uh, we don't want to get involved in messy, dirty wars in the, you know, taking place or, or you know, overseas. Uh, we don't want to get drawn into wars by our ally, the United States. We don't want to put our, uh, you know, servicemen and women in harm's way. Those are, you know, perfectly legitimate uh, concerns and objectives that we have uh, have had. But the thing is, 
Now, world is so globalized. Japan is uh, one of the most uh, important countries in the world, and you know, uh, you know, trying not to take, uh, you know, responsibility, security, international security responsibilities commensurate with our capability, would not be a good idea. So that I think is, a, but uh, still, I mean, there is a strong, you know, still debate going on. There are two schools of thought. One is isolationist, kind of traditional isolationism. NIST, who are, uh, has constituted the mainstream uh, of political discourse in this country, and who's still saying, well, well, why do we have to get involved in messy, dirty wars? I mean, nobody is asking us, so why don't we remain pacifist and isolationist? And the other side, people say, no, the USA is, is kind of might, uh, you know, balance of power is. Uh, um, sifting in favor of China very quickly, and that uh, the U.S. Uh, has been there is an indication that the U.S. might become a little more isolationist in the future. So we have to get more involved and uh, more proactive in order to maintain peace and stability in this region. So I don't know who is right. Uh, I tend to be the you know to support the latter idea of uh, we um, you know Japan becoming a little more uh, internationalist. List, but you know that would incur some costs. We have to pay more attention to um, security affairs. We have to invest more in defense. We have to become more proactive. We might start taking casualties. I mean, so those are the costs. And I'm not. Uh, I perfectly understand the sentiment and the feeling of the isolationist-minded people. So there is, is a debate going on, and uh, we will find out what will happen. Um, Mr. Professor Fulkow and Ms. Just uh, kindly enough to offer um, to take more questions. So, um, if you have more questions, uh, so the first. Thank you. My name is Stefano Carrè for the Italian Economic Daily, Solo 24 Ore. I think the. <coughs> Almost the entire world will be happy if negotiation will start. But I cannot avoid the sensation that in Japan, quite a number of people will not be so happy if the US will start a negotiation on the realistic basis of uh, an immediate goal of uh, freezing the North Korean military program. Because some people would argue, ah, the US are only interested in preventing North Korea to hit uh, US mainland, but we are under threat already. So they will start questioning the level of commitment of US on uh, Japanese uh, defense. So what do you think about this? Thanks. Thank you very much. That's a great point. And uh, I should have talked about it when I was talking about the missile deal. Um, one of the most important objectives that Japan must pursue in a uh, you know, future negotiation would be to, f to make it possible for us to freeze or to force North Koreans to freeze, demand North Koreans to freeze the testing and development of uh, medium-range ballistic missiles as well as intermediate-range ballistic missiles, which are cap basically designed for attack in Japan and Hawaii and Guam. And uh, uh, so I think it's very, well, not Hawaii, Guam and Japan. And uh, in fact, uh, there were, uh, US, the US and uh, North Korea were, were uh, holding what was called missile talks in the 1990s, uh, in which the basic missiles were um, the subject of uh, negotiation. And the uh, Japanese government was all, always telling US officials to take up the you know, issues of MRBM, nodal missiles, right, as an agenda. And they were saying, OK, OK. And, but they are not really fully committed to that. And so the, we have to really work hard to make sure that in any future agreement, MRBM and IRBM will be the target of uh, 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 negotiations. Thank you very much. So last question. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry, uh, the gentleman over there. Thank you. My name is Errol Lemet. I run a, a research co company. Uh, while we're talking, a friend of mine, sorry, a colleague of mine just sent me 
an AP news which appeared on your post uh, describing a Chinese factory of processed food uh, where North Korean workers are working and the products are being expo exported to uh, many Western countries, including the US. So my question is, are there anything being done uh, to avoid this kind of income flowing back into the North Korea? Apparently there are um, thousands of North Korean workers uh, overseas. Thank you. Crossings and everything. I think uh, in almost all commodities uh, that are circulating around the world with a Chinese brand, there may be uh, uh, North Korean or originated items. Uh, I'm sure that the, even among the coals uh, that Japan is importing, there may be uh, North Korean origin originated coals coming to Japan these days. It's not the uh, possible to uh, completely terminate smuggling. Uh, North Korea is a professional in disguising the origin of the cargo, and they're, they're so skillful. Uh, to the contrary, uh, the regulatory authorities of, of almost all UN member states, they're not so skillful because all officials uh, in the position just for two or three or four years to be replaced by uh, completely new people who doesn't know things. So we have to always consider about uh, the element of impossibilities. But having said that, what is really needed is to really uh, integrate the export control regulations and shipping uh, companies are monitoring and also the financial um, transaction activities. The data integration is really uh, key to identifying and uh, uh, preventing the uh, violation of the Security Council resolutions. And that has to be done in an internationally coordinated way. Currently, international cooperation, particularly those with China, is not so good. And even in each country, regulatory authorities uh, stop piping. So there are many rooms for North Korea to really maneuver through these gaps. Uh, that's a sad reality. So we, can, we have to do much better, but we can't stop them. And that's my view. All right, with that, I'd like to conclude today's um, press conference. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Michishita and Dr. Furukama. I'd like to give you uh, some of the honorary one-year membership to the club. So please join us for dinner and coffee to talk about more of these issues. Thank you very much. <laughs>